Yeah? Okay. Hello, friends. Oh, hello, friends. I'm supposed to speak into the microphone, and I'm not very good at that. Hello, hello. Are we ready for our lovely and delightful speaker? Oh, good one. Good one in the attention getting. So hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today on a snowy, beautiful day, um, and and uh, right after spring break. And I know that everybody is like probably dying, just like I am, right after spring break. I have all these delusions about how much I'm going to get done, and then just like the students. And then um, I come back. It's like ah, oh. so. Please um, help me to welcome Michael Louie. He is the Dale and Susie Gallagher Professor of Engineering Education at Purdue, which is Chen's almost alma mater as well. <laughs> um, he was previously Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, so he's like an engineer guy, um, <laughs> like and actually, um, and University Distinguished Teacher Scholar at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Champaign. Champaign. Sorry. Oh, That's gosh. Right. And he serves as editor of the Journal of Engineering Education as a member of the editorial boards of College Teaching and Accountability, Accountability and Research, and a member of the Joint Advisory Group for the Online Ethics Center at the National Academy of Engineering. In 2006, he was elected a fellow of the IEEE for Leadership in the Teaching of Engineering Ethics. In 2003, he was named a Carnegie Scholar by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. He was um, the Associate Dean of Graduate College at Illinois from two, uh, 1996 to 2000. And, <laughs> kind of out breathless, he directed the Theory of Computing program at the National Science Foundation from 1990 to 1991. He earned his PhD at MIT in 1980. So please welcome me, welcome me, and joining, joining me and welcoming, let's clap for <laughs> <laughs> Michael Louie. Very good, thank you. Thank you to all of you for coming here. So please continue eating uh, and getting cake as well. Uh, you can have your cake and eat it too, I hope. Um, we, I hope to provide some food for the mind as well as food for the body. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge the support of the National Science Foundation, which has supported my scholarly work in uh, engineering ethics, and the Daniels Fund for uh, uh, Ethics Initiative here at Colorado School of Mines for uh, bringing me here. So what is engineering? So if you think many of you might think of what you think engineering is, Students say problem solving or applying science and math or something. Here's my definition. Engineering is the art of designing imperfect solutions to meet incomplete specifications by applying unrealistic theories to produce incomprehensible calculations that use inaccurate data based on imprecise measurements taken by inexperienced technicians who have inadequate training to operate unreliable equipment. <laughs> Well, uh, that is one way of thinking of engineering, but there's uh, an official statement of the definition of engineering from the Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, and uh, it says, engineering is the profession in which knowledge of mathematical uh, and natural sciences gained by study, experience, and practice is applied with judgment to develop ways to utilize economically the materials and forces of nature for the benefit of mankind. So I'm going to focus on these two aspects, engineering as a profession and engineering uh, as a profession that uh, is intended to benefit uh, humanity. Um, so uh, like law and medicine, engineering is a profession. Um, and all professions are designed to serve a public good. So medicine, in medicine, the public good is the cause of human health. In law, it's uh, um, the value of justice. In engineering, what's, what's the most important thing that engineers, what's the public value that engineers serve. Any ideas? Solving challenging, Solving challenging problems. problems, that's true. Uh, but uh, um, politicians try to solve challenging problems too. With some this, hope of success. With some hope, well yeah, perhaps. Well. But is there some important value like health or justice? Most people would say safety. Uh, all engineering codes prioritize the importance of safety. Um, and the codes of ethics are useful because they tell us what, what the fundamental values of the, uh, any profession are. Uh, so in engineering, the first codes were, uh, at least in the United States, were <clears throat> published in the early 1900s with the emergence of engineering as a profession. Some people think that the codes of ethics were partly a part of publicity, 
uh, public relations to make engineering seem more like a profession. But the first codes of ethics stressed relationships with um, employers, being a faithful agent of the employer. They were a lot, there were a lot of gentlemen's agreements, etiquette kinds of rules, uh, don't criticize other engineers in public. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but eventually as the profession evolved, um, the predecessor of ABIT called the uh, Engineers Council for Professional Development uh, inserted the paramountcy clause in 1947. It said that engineers shall hold paramount the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So this is the highest and most important value that engineers uh, should strive for is the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Uh, and the paramountcy clause is in all modern engineering codes of ethics, sometimes paraphrased, uh, but they all have this kind of sense. Um, uh, engineering ethics got uh, uh, a, another boost in terms of a, a field of study or an activity uh, in the wake of Watergate, the Watergate scandals of the 1970s. Uh, uh, all professions uh, had an enhanced uh, concern for ethics. Uh, law schools started teaching legal ethics, for example. Um, and uh, through um, joint efforts of the National Science Foundation and the National Endowments of Humanities, uh, there were meetings that brought together engineers and philosophers uh, um, to talk about what are the uh, ethical uh, issues in the profession of engineering. And uh, this then led to the first monographs, textbooks, uh, collections of cases in the 1980s, then academic journals such as Science and Engineering Ethics, which was founded in the mid-1990s, uh, websites such as the Online Ethics Center at Case Western University in 1995, and it's now at the National Academy of Engineering in 2004. So uh, this uh, field has continued to develop. Um, uh, people, have, scholars have been studying this, writing articles, uh, uh, we've been teaching students about it. But throughout all of this, the core concept in engineering ethics is the concept of engineering professional responsibility. So I'm going to tell a, a very short scenario, and short scenarios are frequently used in teaching applied ethics. Um, let's suppose you're an engineer at a firm called International Programmable Machines, or IPM, which makes computers. You're visiting a manufacturing plant of one of IPM suppliers, which sells parts to IPM and other com companies. You notice that a non-IPM system, so it's not your firm, is not properly grounded, and it could cause an electrical shock. Are you responsible? So just pause, think about, it. are you responsible in this situation? How many people think you, the engineer, are responsible? A few. How many people think you're not responsible? OK. So, so take a minute and talk to somebody who differs from you, or if you find somebody who you agree, <laughs> think of arguments for the other side. So let's take a couple minutes and, and uh, do a think pair share here. Okay, I'm going to call time here. Did anybody change their minds? <laughs> Nobody changed their minds? So I'm going to, listen, so I'm going to say you are both right. Oh, you changed your mind. So, so what? I objected to the word responsible. You object to the word responsible. Um, but I, I, I think as a group, our table agreed, we kind of have this professional duty okay. to point it out. Okay, a professional duty to point it out. And one more? Well, I, I just wanted to say this came up with an ABAT discussion. Oh. Because program evaluators tour facilities. Uh -huh. And the question yes. is, is a program evaluator 
required to point out safety issues when yes. you travel? Yes. So there's a good question. An ABIT evaluator uh, who's an engineer, whose value is safety, are they required to point, point out these, uh, these uh, possible deficiencies? So I'm going to say both of you are right. <laughs> There's a sense in which you, the engineer, are not responsible. You're certainly not le legally responsible uh, or legally liable. You can't be sued. It's not your role or task or assigned responsibility. Uh, just because you're not assigned a task, however, doesn't mean that you're not re professionally responsible in some sense. Let me give you an analogy. Uh, suppose you're a hospitalist, that's a doctor who works at a hospital, uh, and you're on a train and a passenger uh, across the aisle is suffering from a heart attack. Well, you, you can't say, no, I'm not at the hospital. It's not my job. Uh, but in a sense, you as a doctor, are res uh, you, have a, you strive for human health. You have the ability to help. You need to do something. So the obligation to promote human health doesn't stop at the door or doesn't stop at 5 o'clock. Similarly, engineers are responsible for safety without any any conditions over when they're responsible. Uh, no condition of where or when. The code of ethics just says you're, you're responsible. It doesn't say uh, only from nine to five or only when you're at your uh, employer. Um, so this sense of responsibility is a broader sense of responsibility than legal liability or role or task responsibility. It's a shared responsibility in that multiple people can be responsible, unlike, say, if you have an assigned responsibility, certain identifiable people are responsible. And uh, so, uh, you know, in a sense, all engineers are responsible for safety. And it's also forward-looking. Uh, sometimes in legal responsibilities, backward-looking. Who was responsible? But in uh, this kind of professional responsibility is forward-looking. We want to be responsible people and think uh, in a, to the future, how can we make uh, things safer? How can we be, fulfill that responsibility? In a sense, responsibility here is like a virtue. So um, there, this is the kind of um, work that, uh, that happens in, in professional ethics and in, particularly in engineering ethics is clarifying when are engineers professionally responsible. So engineering codes of ethics have focused on these professional responsibilities of in individuals, sometimes called microethical obligations. We'll get to macroethics in a moment here. So they'll spell out obligations to clients, such as being competent, being honest, uh, candid even, to employers. There are obligations to employers as well, confidentiality of intellectual property, or particularly trade secrets, uh, confl avoiding conflicts of interest in uh, professional decisions. And then there are also obligations to other professionals, such as mentoring, whereby senior professionals have an obligation to mentor younger ones. Uh, licensing is very important in engineering as well. Uh, there, and, and one of the differences between engineering and other professions is this tension between the obligations to uh, uh, clients and obligations to employers, who are not necessarily the same people. Uh, so the tension might uh, occur because there's an uh, expectation of loyalty to the employer, which may conflict with the obligation to ensure the safety of the public. Uh, codes of ethics for, serve several purposes. One is regulation, especially for those who are licensed and accountable uh, for, uh, for the, um, they can lose their licenses for violating codes of ethics. Uh, education of students as well, and sort of aspirational to helping people aspire to the highest ideals of the profession. Uh, Michael Davis, who apparently was here uh, a few weeks ago. I, I apparently am the third Michael in this series, so. Uh, um, uh, Davis uh, wrote that uh, codes of ethics provide support for engineers who want to act ethically. An engineer who prioritizes safety in a potential whistleblowing situation can uh, say that other engineers would make safety a priority too. So it's a covenant that pr expresses how all engineers would think and provides some support for engineers who want to prioritize safety. Uh, engineering codes of ethics often ignore other uh, responsibilities, the macroethical issues of uh, social policy, such as access to services. So if you look at a social work code of ethics or even medicine law code of ethics, legal codes of ethics, there, there's a big concern about access to services, especially for indigent clients. Uh, but engineering codes of ethics are completely silent on, on access to services. Uh, they generally don't say anything about humanitarian work uh, or helping the public understand technology. Actually, one code of ethics does say that. But um, they're, they're, um, there's no expectation for pro bono work um, uh, in engineering codes of ethics. Um, 
So that's one sort of difference between engineering and other professions. Uh, some recent codes of ethics in engineering mention sustainability, uh, uh, responsibility for sustainability and, and the environment. Uh, the American Society for Civil Engineers had a great, huge dispute when they added uh, commitment to sustainability uh, in their code of ethics. Other classic engineering ethics issues include whistleblowing, as I mentioned, when the obligation of the employer might conflict with the obligation to the public. Uh, gifts and bribes this is a particular concern in the IEEE Code of Ethics, very detailed uh, uh, provisions there, uh, defining risk and safety, um, licensing and regulation. Uh, but the concerns don't include student academic integrity. Some people wonder whether there is a difference between student academic integrity and professional responsibility, and we can talk about that later. And then uh, they don't tend to mention responsible conduct of research, uh, um, uh, which um, um, because they're sort of focused on uh, the concerns of practicing engineers, particularly consulting engineers. Uh, to sum up this part of the talk by Michael Davis again, um, uh, professional ethics belongs to neither common sense nor to philosophy, but to the profession in question. Knowing engineering ethics, some topics such as the, these, is as much a part of knowing how to engineer as knowing how to calculate stress or design a circuit. Indeed, insofar as engineering is a profession, knowing how to calculate stress or design a circuit is in part knowing what the profession allows, forbids, or requires. So ethics is about what is allowed, what is forbidden, or what is required. And so it's not just the dom domain of philosophers, uh, and it's in fact inseparable from doing good engineering. Okay, so the second part of the talk is about uh, current practices in engineering ethics uh, uh, education. And I think we're doing fine on time, so I have another activity for you in a, in a little while. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, accreditation board for engineering technology, or they changed their name now, they're just ABET, they're just the four letter uh, organization, has required instruction in engineering ethics for many years. Uh, President Trump is fond of saying, a lot of people don't know, so a lot of people don't know that accreditation standards for engineering have required ethics instruction for many years. Um, I found this quotation from the 1986 uh, guidelines. An understanding of the ethical, social, economic, and safety considerations in engineering practice is essential for a successful engineering career. Coursework may be provided for this purpose, but as a minimum, it should be with the responsibility of the engineering faculty to infuse professional concepts into all engineering coursework. <clears throat> I think we've fallen quite short of that ideal. Um, uh, the emphasis for engineering ethics gained, uh, gained greater energy uh, with the adoption of Engineering Criteria 2000, where the, it was called out explicitly in Criterion 3F that uh, students, by the end of their engineering programs, should demonstrate an understanding of professional and ethical responsibility. Uh, it doesn't say they should behave ethically, it just says they should understand it. <laughs> well, you know, you, they can promise only so much, right? And then uh, a related criterion, uh, the broad education necessary to understand the impact of engineering solutions in a global economic, environmental, and social, societal context. Um, so there's, there's been concerns. Uh, it's basically a requirement that all engineering programs must uh, ensure these kinds of outcomes by the end of the uh, student's undergraduate engineering program. Uh, and uh, so different engineering programs across higher education have taken different approaches. Um, uh, there's a required three credit course at Texas A&M for all undergraduates in engineering, uh, or the equivalent amount of material is spread over four courses at the University of Virginia, uh, where they also do engineering communication and um, um, some, some other professional development things. So that's uh, at the high end. Um, many institutions require one credit course. Oh, I should mention some uh, uh, church affiliated, some re religious institutions require some philosophy courses, so that, but those are not specifically in engineering ethics. Um, many institutions might have a one credit course in engineering ethics or even less, one or two class sessions in one course, uh, what I, uh, I've called drive-by ethics here, <laughs> um, as little as possible. Um, since Michael Davis was here, he probably told you that uh, they had this idea of uh, into integrating ethics across the curriculum, so short, short sessions and multiple courses. Um, and that requires some coordination, uh, or somebody to coordinate that. Uh, I don't think it's been widely adopted. 
Uh, I understand Sandy is your ethics across the curriculum person here, so that's really terrific. You have somebody who can help uh, faculty in multiple disciplines with whatever amounts of ethics that they want to uh, have in their, in their uh, programs. So I, well, you know, I wonder, if ethics is so important, why do engineering faculty resist teaching engineering ethics? Um, or why do most engineering programs devote such minimal effort to engineering ethics? I have proposed uh, that engineering faculty suffer from three mistaken beliefs. The first belief, uh, many faculty members in engineering believe that college teaching requires, consists of transferring information from experts to students. And so as a consequence, logically, subjects should be taught by experts. In particular, uh, as, engineer, as a profession, engineering highly values tech technical expertise and competence. Let the, yet the dirty little secret of the academy is that faculty members often teach courses outside their expertise. For example, when they teach a survey course that introduces students to the breadth of a discipline, they may be experts in only one of the course topics. It's very funny when I teach Introduction to Electrical and Computer Engineering. I know nothing about electronics, but I'm teaching them transistors and just you have to do it. So the, the, look, it's freshmen. It, it can't be that hard. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm teaching well outside my expertise. In fact, my expertise is on the computer science end. So anything in the, uh, even the electrical power end or elect circuits, um, it's just, it's very funny. So uh, there's a great book called Teaching What You Don't Know by Therese Houston. Uh, uh, for ethics, the goals, uh, um, are to teach moral reasoning skills, not really specific content. And presumably, engineering instructors know about engineering practice so they can bring that kind of expertise into the subject of uh, engineering ethics for, th for them to be teaching it. The second uh, mistaken belief is that ethics belongs to philosophy and not in engineering. Let me make the argument that um, all disciplines have incorporated as part of their foundations pieces that might have uh, originated in other fields. So let's say uh, applied mathematics is one of the standard branches of mathematics. All engineering disciplines have incorporated the mathematical foundations. So linear system theory and control theory are parts of electrical engineering programs, even though they look like pretty much like pure math. Analogously, although ethics is one of the standard branches of philosophy, um, Every professional program incorporates instruction in the special ethical responsibilities of its profession. Medical students learn the professional responsibilities of uh, physicians. Law students learn the professional responsibilities of attorneys. Similarly, since engineering is a profession, engineering schools should teach the professional responsibilities of engineers. And those special responsibilities um, um, are expressed in the engineering so codes of ethics, things like confidentiality, confidentiality of intellectual property, conflicts of interest, and so on. Now, of course, we're all supposed to honor confidences, but engineers have special responsibilities uh, for confidentiality. Similarly, we're all not supposed to endanger other people, but engineers have these special responsibilities to promote safety. So a third uh, mistaken belief is that only technical knowledge belongs to engineering. Um, the, unfortunately, the culture of engineering tends to valorize the technical and disparage the non-technical. However, if we think of ourselves as educating professionals, all professionals require both technical and non-technical knowledge. If we take an analogy with the medicine again, skilled physicians should understand not only how a drug works biochemically, but also how to communicate uh, the, a drug's risks to patients. Similarly, uh, engineers should understand te non-technical knowledge like project management, how to resolve conflicts between, uh, 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 between people, but also conflicts in professional obligations, which is one of the things you learn in an ethics course. So, um, engineering ethics instruction often begins with stories of disasters like the Challenger Space Shuttle, which was quite formative for uh, people of my generation. Students today think it's just something historical. Um, uh, you know, engineers played a major role in trying to prevent the disaster, which arose from a confluence of factors like a flawed design, a known misapplication of O-rings, unusually low temperatures predicted at the morning of the launch. Um, there was a dramatic teleconference at the Martin, Martin, Martin Thiecol the night before the launch where the vice president of engineering was told, chillingly, take off your engineering hat and put on your management hat. So this is a great story. Uh, it's very memorable. It has, um, has that emotional content. But of course, every engineering discipline has um, a touchstone disaster case. Uh, so um, in electrical engineering, we talk about the Bay Area rapid transit. Uh, um, uh, system where you had uh, really poor, uh, the three engineers blew the whistle over inadequate software engineering. Uh, Bhopal, 
chemical, um, a fire ke union chemical plant in Bhopal killed 3,000 people. Bjork Shali height valve case um, where um, excess of stress is on a strut. A new design, yep, new design. Um, the strut failed and uh, people died. Um, aerospace says lots and lots of disasters. Uh, Columbia uh, Space Shuttle is almost a, a, a a, play, uh, a duplicate of the uh, Challenger, the DC-10 cargo door uh, that blew out in the middle of a flight, uh, the Ford Pinto for mechanical engineers, uh, where Ford engineers could have installed a part for less than $11 to prevent uh, to reduce the possibility that a punctured of a punctured gas tank from a rear end collision, and they miscalculated the cost benefit analysis. Uh, shows you where cost they went wildly wrong with the estimate of the cost. The Kansas City Hyatt, uh, which uh, the walkways, uh, the design was not manufacturable. There was a design change in the field that had an inadequate margin of safety and uh, killed uh, over 100 people when it, they collapsed. And the Therac 25, which uh, we tell in software engineering, uh, people think software can't kill, but software errors led to the deaths of uh, several cancer patients by this uh, cancer radiation treatment machine. And of course, nuclear uh, engineering has its Three Mile Island and the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, we also, um, and so engineering ethics instruction has always been about uh, lots of stories, uh, uh, lots of uh, real cases, smaller cases uh, uh, from the National, Science, uh, National Society for Professional Engineers Board of Ethical Review. Um, these tend to be about uh, consulting engineers getting into trouble. And, um, and then I developed uh, these, uh, somebody mentioned Incident and Morales, I think, and Henry's Daughters, two videos uh, that dramatize fictional but uh, realistic cases uh, that are used for instruction. So I think I have a case for you. So let's suppose you're an engineer who works for the state government, but you hope to leave soon for a higher paying job at Bucknell Corporation. Your advising committee, a committee that's considering three bids to, for constructing a new government building, one bid comes from Bucknell, and you think Bucknell's bid is the best. Should you advise the committee to accept Bucknell's bid? Why or why not? So let me pause, let you think about that for um, a moment. So say, how many say yes? Go for it. Could benefit you, yeah. How many people think no? Oh, so, so th this is a case uh, where, again, there's, there's could be dis differences of opinion and uh, we would have students uh, discuss what's going on here um, and uh, what, what kinds of issues might come to play. Uh, particularly, I find that uh, beginning students tend not to see the conflict of interest uh, uh, you don't actually officially have a conflict of interest because you don't work for Bucknell Corporation, but what would happen if the next month you leave uh, your job at the state government, you've advised them Bucknell gets the contract, and then suddenly you leave and go to Bucknell. It would look really bad. Um, so uh, 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 students often don't understand that um, even though uh, it, you don't have a formal conflict of interest, there's at least an apparent conflict of interest that still uh, would uh, would um, cause uh, less public trust in the, uh, the committee's decision. And when you're dealing with professionals, uh, professionals make decisions on which people rely, so it's important that these decisions be trustworthy. So the, this is the kind of case that we would use, and we'd bring out all these kinds of issues as well. Um, let's see. We have another. Want to do another scenario? Another short one? Yeah, OK. So this is another short scenario. Uh, everyday cases. You design the engines that Galactic Motors, uh, also known as GM, <laughs> hopes to use in future all-electric cars. Six months ago, you left Galactic for managerial positions with Forge Motor Company, uh, which is a direct competitor. After restructuring, however, Forge's vice president asks you to lead a design team to develop engines, engines for Forge's planned, new, uh, planned electric cars. The vice president hints that Forge is very interested in the design concepts that you previously developed at Galactic Motors. How should you respond? And for what reasons? We pause here. <coughs> yeah? <laughs> any, any, well, anybody have a really good, good response? Christoph, well, yeah. The question is, what, what did we sign? Ah, what, did we sign anything? Right. But that would be a legal obligation. So what, 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 what could you, what, what, so this is missing information. This is great. Yeah. So what, there, there, you, the engineer, could have signed something. Uh, when and where? 
Like a non-compete clause. A non-compete clause, right. Yeah. So it's, it's often the case that uh, engineers have to sign a non-compete clause they, if they go, they're not supposed to work on a directly competing project or for a direct competitor depending. It, these, these clauses are written differently depending on the level of responsibility you had. But let's say uh, six months, maybe it's beyond the period. We'll, maybe we'll change it a little bit so it's just beyond the period of that non-compete agreement. Okay, so maybe you're completely free now, right? Spill the beans, you work for Forge Motor Company now. Tell me, you work for us. Okay, you have another response, what, Angus? What's the problem? I mean, what's the problem? Yeah. It's, if, if Galactic Motors really wanted to protect their property, they should have been smart enough to dis to, to brain, wash your brain out of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> to, to hire some lawyers that would make me sign a real non -compete. Right, okay. So yes, if Galactic Motors had been very uh, so concerned about this, they would have tried to protect the uh, property better or, um, uh, you know, real non-compete clause or something. So that, that, those, are legal, those are legal methods, right? Do, did somebody back there have a good response? Or? Yes? I mean, if you're managing, if you're managing, yeah. Right, you, you, can, you can sort of at least start by coughing it up to those folks who are supposed to be doing the, the real legwork on right. the engineering side. That's right. That's, that's true. So the, uh, in a sense, you're not doing the real work if you're doing the manager. But, <laughs> but you know, this, this still looks kind of fishy, right? So one of the mysterious things here is that you might have some obligations to a previous employer. And this is quite surprising to many students here. There, obviously, well, there's this obligation to hold trade secrets confidential. So, uh, presumably, the design concepts are trade secrets. Trade secrets are protected by criminal law. You could go to jail, uh, and but uh, you, that would be difficult to prove unless there was a lot of documentation that you removed. So, and that's a very high standard as well. I mean, beyond reasonable proof. Uh, trade secrets. Uh, there's no protection for a trade secret if it's rediscovered. So uh, that's sort of the relevant law here. Um, still, there's, there, there is this obligation of confidentiality. Um, even if, uh, and that's kind of a professional obligation beyond the legal obligation, right? So is there a way of responding here uh, where you're being pressured to divulge the trade secrets from the uh, other company? I have a great rejoinder here. So the rejoinder is, you would not want me to divulge Forge's trade secrets if the tables were reversed. And I had gone from Forge to GM, right? So that's kind of like a reversibility test or, or looking at it from the viewpoint of somebody else. Um, and that's the kind of thing students would learn is uh, how to respond to situations like this by thinking about these other um, considerations. Now, uh, some of these, these cases often have potential wrongdoing. Uh, some people believe that positive cases can promote virtuous behavior. Um, this is uh, the, one of the most famous is a story of, of uh, moral exemplars, uh, such as William LeMessure at Citicorp Center. Um, so rather than using disasters, we, we went a positive case where William LeMessure uh, blew the whistle on himself when he realized that the 59-story Citicorp Center building, which is shown in the middle and the right, would fall down in a 16-year storm. So he was a structural engineer. Very innovative design, again, new design. Uh, his, uh, doing the uh, calculations, the original uh, um, design had not accounted for the effects of quartering winds, which approach the corner of a building. So normally, the corner of a building is the strongest point because you have a support under there. But the supports here are in the center of the building because the building is built over a, a protected area of a church. So this is an innovative design. They didn't account for the effects of quartering winds, which uh, were um, uh, where, uh, and if the winds came at, at that direction, um, the building would fall down in a storm that, was, that was, uh, would occur every 16 years or so. Um, and he realizes this, and, there's hurricane, uh, uh, and it's about to, about to be hurricane season. Uh, he, goes to, he blows the whistle on himself, um, and together they, uh, Citicorp, uh, um, and with him doing the calculations, install these large steel plates like Band-Aids, uh, as a hurricane is sweeping up the eastern seaboard. Uh, the New York Times got word of something peculiar is going on at the Citicorp Center, and then they went on strike. So it was all done very quietly. There was no panic. Um, the next year, when uh, the professional library, li 
the professional liability insurance company wanted to raise their premiums, LeMessurier dispatched a lieutenant to the company who said, after how honorably we have behaved, how dare you raise our premiums? And so the premiums actually went down. Um, so the idea is it's a positive case. He, they blew the whistle on themselves. Nothing bad happened. They spent $2 million to fix it. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that positive emotions should promote longer-term motivation. But we actually don't know. Uh, we don't have the research to show that yet, and that sort of leads me to uh, research on engineering ethics education and the current state of the art on that. So we've been teaching this for a while. We've been using the materials developed in the 80s, 90s, and, um, and even more. There are people still developing case materials, but we don't really know uh, answers to some basic questions, such as what learning outcomes are, are possible. Davis, again, says teaching engineering ethics can achieve at least four desirable outcomes. Increased ethical sensitivity, that is being able to perceive an eth ethical situation. Knowledge about relevant standards of conduct, such as codes of ethics. Improved judge judgment in reasoning through cases. And then improved ethical willpower, which would be a greater ability to act ethically when one wants to. So that might mean better behavior. Really? Um, so clearly, we could probably help students be able to perceive uh, ethical issues such as conflicts of interest, um, knowing that there are relevant standards, maybe even knowing what the standards say, uh, reasoning through some cases. Uh, but it's hard to say whether there will be an effect on behavior. Uh, I've done some research on effect on identity, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about that later. So it, you know, it's not clear which of these desired learning outcomes are really uh, actually achievable. Even if we were to have these outcomes, how can we actually assess these outcomes? Um, some, uh, actually, that uh, people think that some of these skills, like professional skills, are difficult to assess. Uh, but we've actually, uh, there's been some very good work recently on development of methods to assess these outcomes. And then uh, we all use cases when we teach engineering ethics, but we actually don't know whether something else might be better uh, or whether real or artificial cases are better or positive or negative cases, or what better even means. So um, there's a lot that, that's not known. Um, I mentioned uh, substantial efforts to develop assessment instruments. Uh, so uh, uh, Bornstein and his colleagues at Georgia Tech developed a test of ethical sensitivity or awareness of uh, eth just being able to identify issues such as conflicts of interest. Uh, they also developed a um, test of ethical reasoning called the Engineering and Science Issues Test, which is very similar to uh, the um, DIT2, the Defining Issues Test, which is based on Kohlberg's theory of moral development. And so uh, just like that test, there are scenarios, and students respond to them with uh, which are the most important considerations. Um, and then uh, there's another uh, 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 instrument that's under development called the Engineering Ethics Reasoning Instrument, also uh, structured like the DIT2, uh, which is very much specific to engineering teams. Uh, and the lead author is a brilliant scholar who's uh, work, been working on this. Uh, his name is Zhu. Yeah. OK. So uh, some, uh, these instruments were developed partly to, so that we have a, uh, can actually have some standard way of assessing whether students are uh, achieving our learning objectives. Uh, this because some of the early work on on um, uh, engineering ethics uh, had sort of mixed results, right? So there was some early work uh, that indicates that instruction in engineering ethics might improve moral reasoning skills, and others that says that they might not. So there are interesting conflicting findings in the literature. Um, I think, yes, I use the same instrument that Drake did, so uh, you know, you, you'd think that there might be some comparability, but the pedagogy was very different. In fact, part of the difference is that I think pedagogy or teaching methods uh, might actually make a difference here. Um, but there was some, some um, dissatisfaction with the DIT2 as a very general ethics assessment instrument, so that's what prompted the development of more engineering-specific instruments. Um, Barry and Olin had a study that showed that having more ethic, increasing amount of ethics instruction might not help. And as their assessment, they used the uh, ethics questions of the professional engineering licensing exam. So they had a very large data set, but students who had more uh, hours of instruction didn't seem to do, necessarily do better. So we don't know. Um, so uh, again, this is a biased sample of results here. Um, 
Well, I did some work that showed that a course in engineering ethics can affect students' understanding of and feelings about professional responsibility. Uh, we documented, used qualitative methods to describe how students' understandings and feelings about professional responsibility can change, um, especially when we compared responses of students who had taken a full course in engineering ethics, uh, namely my course, so uh, with, with those who had not. So it was an interesting comparison of different groups of students. And I'd like to read a quotation from one student who had taken the course. Now I understand how broadly engineers can influence society, but with this power comes the ability to do harm as well. The professional engineer, as with all professionals, should consider the implications of their actions, especially with respect to the public. Some of the most interesting and most influential articles we read were the ones that empowered me to the best, be the best engineer I can be, not only because my parents influenced me to be, become an honest and hardworking person, but rather because of the power and responsibility I will have when I graduate. So if students can internalize that sense of professional responsibility, I think that's a great outcome of an engineering ethics course. It would be nice to be able to measure that uh, as well as having these um, more uh, qualitative results. Um, so I mentioned some people are interested in the connection between academic integrity and behavior and practice. We have some uh, very interesting study by uh, um, John Carpenter and his uh, associates um, uh, that, again, based on self-reported data, like uh, have you committed a white collar crime or something? Uh, anyway, uh, so self-reported ethical um, um, uh, missteps in the workplace with whether they cheated as, as students. So um, there, there seems to be some correlation there. But there's a lot that's not known. So uh, opportunities for more research. Let me sum up here so we have lots of time for questions here. So in summary, uh, engineering ethics has tended to emphasize the professional responsibilities of en individual engineers rather than broader questions of social responsibility. There are some people who are very interested in engineering for social responsibility, and many of those people are here, uh, or in the state of Colorado, up at uh, UC and Boulder, or CU, I guess it's called here. Uh, the amount of ethics instruction varies widely among uh, undergraduate programs. It's generally minimal because engineering faculty have a mistaken beliefs about uh, teaching e engineering ethics. Uh, ethics instruction uses a variety of cases, but there's been very little empirical research on uh, the effectiveness of uh, teaching using cases or different pedagogies that might use cases or other kinds of methods of teaching. And um, so there's actually a great opportunity for more research on engineering ethics and you at Colorado School of Mines here are perfectly situated to do this research and I hope that you will do so. So thank you very much. Okay, so we have time for questions or cake. You Remember I said you can have your cake and eat it too. Question in the back. Um, could you comment on the difference between engineering ethics and science ethics? Ah, excellent question. Yes. Yeah. Right. So um, a typical difference between science and engineering ethics, and in fact, there's an article about this that notice the, notices the difference. Um, in engineering ethics, uh, as in science ethics, there are some co concerns that are fairly common, like data management, pre pretty common. But uh, engineering uh, ethics has tended to focus on what we'd say uh, professional responsibilities um, to the public. And science ethics has tended to focus on what are scientists' responsibilities to each other. So accurate reporting, uh, co-authorship, um, uh, uh, let's see, uh, sort of generally within the realm of responsible conduct of research. There's actually even a greater emphasis on, I would say, publication ethics, uh, uh, human and animal subjects. So the concerns have been sort of very different. Uh, and, and partly because uh, scientists um, don't have as strong a sense of professionalism as engineers do. So you don't have to get a professional license to be a scientist. Uh, there are many engineers who don't have professional licenses either, but it's at least available and it's part of the culture of the, the profession. So um, yeah, the, there's, uh, there's sort of a difference in, in the relative priorities of, of uh, concerns. Um, I mean, everybody's concerned about safety, you know, so lab safety, that's, that's sort of taken for granted. I mean, you have lab safety in science, but you don't elevate it to like your highest value, right? I think accurate reporting is probably the most important thing. So, the reason, yeah. The question, yes. You, know, um, you get some water. Like it's maybe increasingly politicized, right? So what scientists 
Mm -hmm. in terms Thank of you. Uh, you know, climate change or something like that has a big effect in the culture. Yes, so that, that's an interesting question again to repeat for the video. Uh, a lot of science is becoming increasingly politicized as funding uh, follows, um, especially in the United States where, uh, where there's a lot of federal funding and thus it is using the public's dollars and thus there's a political process and uh, the, there might be greater influences of uh, political factions on choices of what can be funded and what not, such as you mentioned with climate change. Um, that, that hasn't been as a much a concern in, in engineering ethics. Uh, the, the, where engineering has um, approached the public is more with policy issues such as, um, say, uh, energy policies or, or environmental regulations. Um, and there, uh, there, then you would have more encounter with political aspects. Engineers tend to serve as a culture to uh, try to avoid politics. Um, I think that, and, and scientists I suppose have too, but I think maybe scientists are more exposed because of the large amount of public money. Um, uh, perhaps uh, civil engineers might possibly, uh, they're also doing projects with public money, but usually the civil engineers see themselves as, well the decision's already made, made, that's somebody else's problem, I have a certain budget, I'm going to try to meet my budget. So that's, that's sort of a different attitude I think. Yeah, another question? Well, just to follow up on yeah. John's question, it seems like the problem can, that's difficult yeah. to deal with in engineering is your responsibility to whom. Ah, right. And so you say, climate change, am I responsible to future generations who have to deal with the effects of climate change mm -hmm. or am I responsible to the people who might put out of work in the mm -hmm. coal mining mm -hmm. industry today? Yes. Um, the same thing with designing freeways in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Am I responsible to the people who are going to face traffic chaos because I didn't consider fire hazards? Or am I over designing the, the freeway mm -hmm. because what's the chances of a giant fire under a, the freeway? Yeah, so that, that's a great example of, of where uh, um, engineers have these different, you know, what, who, who, who is within the realm of concern for engineers? I mean, the future generations, the public, uh, ideally, uh, Remember, the engineers are, should be concerned about the health, safety, and welfare of the public, and that goes to uh, understanding or interpreting what the public means, and I would think that most of us would try to broaden students, um, since I'm only an educator, broaden students' conceptions and beyond simply uh, concerned about the individual, uh, the, what the client wants. So uh, those are indeed important, important considerations, and engineers should be, I think, uh, most of us would agree, should be thinking more broadly about that. Uh, yeah, the over-designing is a very interesting question. Um, you know, even though it's not in the specifications, uh, are there, should engineers bring up uh, possible harms to the public uh, that might not even be in the specifications? This happens in computer engineering where uh, uh, frequently um, uh, security or privacy uh, concerns are, are usually not part of the specifications. And, and many of us think that that's part, partly something engineers should bring up, should call attention to. Uh, over there, in the, uh, yeah, go ahead. So there, Let me see, let's try to get you on, on tape well, I, here. I can be loud. You can be loud, okay, very good. Yeah. Well, stand close. So there, there seems to be an increasing dialogue around the ethics of big data and mm -hmm. analytics of big yes. data. Mm -hmm. And does it actually represent what we say it's representing? Mm -hmm. Do you see that discussion now growing in the engineering discipline around big data? I've not seen it in the engineering discipline, but I've started seeing articles about ethics of big data, privacy concerns. Uh, uh, I'm with a group that does big data analytics for student records. So yes, this is, uh, I've not seen engineers per se, but cer certainly in the computer science and information technology community, which are related uh, communities, uh, there's great concern for that. Absolutely. So that's a contemporary issue. So a question over here. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Here. Thanks for your talk. Um, I, would you tell us more about the assessments um, for uh, effective pedagogy? Um, oh. In terms of specifically what is not working well for assessing and what is working? What looks to be what look working well for assessing students? So what's lo working well and what's not working well f in terms of being able to assess uh, student outcomes? Bingo, yeah. Ah, yes. Um, well, I first of all, I think uh, anything is better than nothing. So, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, we, we teach it, we talk about it, 
do we, do we actually assess it? Um, so I, I don't think there are a lot of good practices out there that are well known. I mean, um, if you come to my workshop tomorrow, <laughs> you'll learn what I consider good practices are in assessment from very simple formative classroom assessments through uh, uh, grading rubrics. Um, so I, I would say that uh, in terms of what or ordinary engineering professors can do, uh, there are some good practices that I, I'm going to suggest. but. Um, uh, and there's a bit of research that shows that, the, that at least the, the rubrics can be done reliably. So, um, um, yeah, so I would say that uh, coming up with um, uh, grading rubrics that are where the criteria are aligned to your learning goals, uh, uh, that's gen a generally good practice. Um, uh, and then there's, of course, ordinary uh, academic papers. That's a form of individual assessment as well. And you can, uh, provided you uh, articulate the grading, the standards, you can then reasonably reliably grade them um, and assess students' progress toward reasoning. Um, sensitivity, again, you could have factual tests, uh, uh, what, what different codes of uh, ethics are, or sensitivity test is, uh, you know, is, what, is this situation a conflict of interest or what, what that is. So I think that some standard academic um, me mechanisms are possible. What is, we don't know yet is how to assess behavior <laughs> uh, I mean, I, in a reliable way, especially long-term behavior. Ideally, we'd like our, our students to go out and, and behave honorably and with integrity as professionals. That's, I don't know how to do that. And it's very hard because there are all these long-term uh, influences when you talk about longitudinal outcomes. All kinds of things happen to students. Um, it's not clear that, a, well, I'm fairly sure that one or two sessions are unlikely to have a major impact, although it can happen. Yeah. Um, in fact, I was talking to a student I'm doing a, a supervising senior thesis with. Uh, she said she attended one talk in her freshman year about uh, uh, a materials failure. I think it was the rivets of the Titanic. Uh, certain, uh, they were transitioning over to newer ways of making rivets or something. But anyway, the steel was not adequate. And that impressed her on the importance of uh, um, thinking about the safety of the public as a materials engineer. So uh, sometimes I think one of our sessions might have a lifelong impact, but uh, it's hard to do that reliably. Um, I think uh, what we should be doing now is certainly having careful assessments of what we're doing in the classroom and just be up to st sort of good practices uh, as, as ordinary college instructors. Okay, so come, come tomorrow, or else there will be a video. Yes? What do companies do in terms of professional development? Oh, so what do companies do in terms of professional development? Um, it, um, it varies a bit, but I think uh, a lot, I, I've met a number of corporate uh, people from um, uh, corporations who are very involved in ethics instruction. It tends to be business ethics. It tends to be fairly straightforward kinds of things. But uh, things, um, but the human resources departments are often marshaled to do some of this ethics training. They call it training because it's like human resources um, a function. And there, there's a lot of corporate money that goes into this uh, ev everyday ethics training. Uh, at, um, at Texas Instruments has been a leader and has a minimum number of hours per year. I don't remember exactly what it is, specifically on uh, ethics and for engineers would typically do something in engineering ethics. Uh, they'd have a speaker come in or, or something. So there's some number of hours of training, but um, we were having a, at Purdue, the, I'm now at Purdue, so the Purdue team, we were having some conversations with some industry folks and yes, they do ethics programs, but they don't do any assessment. So I said, opportunity, we, we've got some of the best people who do assessment and we'd be happy to partner with you. So this is like conversations right now. Uh, if corporations are investing millions of dollars in this training, like to know what they're getting for their money. So that's where they're at. There's a lot of attention to it. It's in, they consider it's important. You want to stay out of the scandals. Um, you know, that's kind of the motivation. Uh, uh, but um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not known how effective the different kinds of programs are. And I think uh, we as educators, especially since I'm in engineering education, I think we have a great opportunity here to uh, work with the people in industry and corporations to uh, make their training programs even more effective.
And, but to know whether it's effective or not, you need assessment tools, right? So that's, that's exactly where the problem is. Opportunity for the future here. Yes, question here, let me. Let me ask, uh, let me ask my question in a provocative way. Can ethics education be assessed? And wh what I mean by that is this. We, we work with adolescents, yes. right? I mean, with the male students that we teach, their brains aren't even fully grown. Correct. And so we, we, can, we, can, we can test whether they have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have, have a certain awareness of ethical mm -hmm. issues, but yes. when the rubber meets the road, when they have to make decisions, mm -hmm. that's a completely different situation. Mm -hmm. So uh, are we just not, are we, um, are we just jumping through the hoop with our assessment of mm -hmm. ethics because that's, that's sort of the, the vogue in education mm -hmm. land now and without, uh, without assessment you cannot get anything funded these days. Mm -hmm. um, but does it really make sense or do we just have to send off these, these kids on their, on their life and just see what happens? <laughs> and, and are we more in the, in the business of planting seeds than yes. educating? Okay. That's a very good question here. So, you know, we have people who are uh, not fully there's especially in traditional, I assume you have mostly traditional age college students here. Uh, and as you say, they're sort of late adolescents, they're just growing out of adolescence. There's some research to show that uh, brains are not fully formed until age 25 or so, uh, which is sort of when you take your qualifying exam in your doctoral studies, you're the smartest you'll ever be. Right? And then it's all downhill from there. Um, there's actually some truth to that. Uh, so yes, is it that we're planting some seeds that might uh, help them grow, and I, I'd say that probably that's true of, of all of our instruction. We can't expect more out of ethics instruction than we expect out of people teaching circuits or strength of materials or statics and dynamics. Uh, but I think we can help people with a lot of these process outcomes. We can help them uh, be aware that there are uh, some, some basic knowledge. There is a code of ethics. Uh, and, and some of the process skills, like being able to reason through things uh, a little better. We do know that, um, uh, and that's, you know, otherwise if we had, if, if we didn't believe that that's possible, why are we, what are we doing trying to educate people? So I think that uh, overall we know that college education does make a difference, uh, even beyond what students come in with. Uh, they, they do exit with, uh, uh, actually, I mean, there's actually a, a long set of research on uh, college outcomes for, at the general level in terms of reasoning skills, um, uh, uh, better sense of values, better, uh, uh, better health outcomes, a, a lot of reasons why higher education is beneficial for, for students. So I think that um, beyond the specifics of what we're teaching here, uh, uh, that there, there can still be these, these good outcomes. And I, I still think it's important for us to be intentional and, and to have some sense of whether we're, we're, we're succeeding. And that's why assessment is so important. I don't think assessment's a fad. I think it's not going to go away. I, I think it's just part of being professional about knowing whether, we're, having some idea of whether we're succeeding or not. Come to my workshop tomorrow. You get a big dose of assessment. Oh, are we out of time already, Sandy? Yeah. Right. Oh, we, but we have philosophers in the audience, so there's always questions. Well, well, but they're not quick, right? right? That's the problem with philosophers. Yeah. Well, thank you again for being here, and hopefully everyone can join us in this very room again <laughs> tomorrow from 2 until 4, if you can come. Um, and, and Michael Louie will help us do better in our instruction to, and assessment. I'm not good at assessment. I don't yeah. All right. Okay, thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.